Good morning. Good morning and hello and good morning and how are you? We've had a long, a very hot summer and we had the first sort of decent thunderstorm last night. Now I must remember the Wiggly Roads are shut. I think, or at least they were closing them yesterday. So I'm going to assume that they're at least closed or still closed today. Oh, hello, that's a bit bright. I hope you're well. Sorry about the lighting, poor lighting today. Thought I'd do a quick uh, vodcast as uh, there's been a bit of a development in terms of uh, movement on the NHS. National uh, uh, Health Service Terms and Conditions. No, Anna. What are you going to do? Are you going to pull into that pull-in thing now? No, you're just going to drive straight through it. You're going to pull in, aren't you? Yes. Because you're sensible. You're a bit of a wise driver. No, so um, Department of Health has uh, announced that they're going to do a few things. So I thought I'd just comment on them because obviously, you know, I had a little bit of experience at uh, negotiating on terms and conditions at a national level. And one of the things that they're going to do, which is something I suggested to the House of Commons Health Select Committee, God knows how many years ago, probably 10 years ago, which was that the uh, UDA system, Unit of Dental Activity, which divides courses of treatment up into three. So I always said it was like the baby bear's porridge. It was uh, small, medium and large, you know, or cold, hot and just about right. And they divided all courses of treatment into one of these three categories and paid a flat rate, depending on which category it fell into. But the problem is that that meant that a lot of treatments, which were quite diverse in terms of their resource requirements and uh, in, you know, in terms of money and uh, time and skill, were lumped into the same band. And the biggest problem was the band B, the middle one, because all the uh, examinations and uh, uh, x-rays and things were in the lowest band, and all the dentures and the crowns were in the highest band, which led, which led to absolutely everything else being in the middle band. And two of the most egregious failures were the, the failure to, or, or the, the, the fact that root treatments and extractions are both in the same band. Now a, a root treatment being a highly complicated and technically very skillful, fiddly, time consuming, expensive treatment to save a tooth, and the extraction which is an e extremely simple, relatively quick and cheap way to remove a tooth. Both of which solve the same problem, which is a painful tooth. Obviously with the one you get to keep the tooth, the other one you don't. But, um, you know, it's bad enough with uh, trying to convince patients to try and keep their own teeth and have root treatments done privately without the um, added uh, disincentive of the dentist being rewarded to do the extraction as well. So if the patient wants the cheapest and the quickest route out of pain, then, I mean, I would argue that if you start the root treatment, then that also qualifies as, as, a, as a quite cheap. But then you've, you've got this sort of um, expense hangover in that, you know, you can say, well, I'll get you out of pain, and then you can decide what to do with the tooth. Um, and then uh, even if you do that free of charge, then it's not going to disguise the fact that ultimately they're going to have to pay to have a root treatment done. And there's nothing more aggravating than spending time in, you know, that you haven't got getting a patient out of pain by starting a root treatment only for them to come back and say that they have been thinking about it and they'd rather have the tooth out, you know, which you could have done for them on day one. But anyway, um, the fact that root treatments and uh, let's just simplify it, the fact that root treatments and extractions are in the same band means that dentists get paid the same, it doesn't matter which they do, and therefore they tend to want to do the cheapest and simplest treatment. And, and that coincides with the patient's desire as well, for the most part. 
So um, good dentistry doesn't get done, but quick cheap dentistry gets done. And so you get you go back to this 1948 scenario where you know of, uh, blood and extraction, blood and plastic they used to call it, or blood and shellac, whatever it was, composite at the time. And um, where basically all the NHS is doing is providing extractions and dentures. So the answer really was to have more bands. Uh, and what they've done is they say they're going to introduce, introduce enhanced UDAs to support higher needs of patients, recognising the range of different treatment options currently remunerated under band two. So that's what they've done is they've effectively acknowledged that they've got too much treatment lumped together in band two. And that they, um, uh, people are not getting the treatments that um, are what they call the higher the higher needs patients in other words the patients who need root treatments uh, they're not getting the root treatments they're just getting the extractions so I don't know how they're going to do that I mean my guess is that they'll have they'll split band A into two or even three but probably two um, and uh, have two A and two B and they'll have uh, 2A will be include extractions and 2B will include root fillings and perhaps 2A will include up to three fillings and 2B will include four or more fillings um, now how they're going to do that I don't know because uh, you know it implies that to keep it budget revenue neutral they're going to have to uh, pay more for 2B and less for 2A um, or whether they're just going to bump up and they're going to introduce the 2B and, and pay more for 2B, I don't know. But that's one thats one thing that, uh, you know, and it's only taken them 10 years to suggest this. After I mentioned that it, would, it needed doing, and, and they thought about it for 10 years and then decided to do it. So the second thing, they're going to produce some supportive material for patients, the public, and dental teams around nice recall intervals and introduce an extra field on the FP17 form to help peer review and monitoring uh, of adherence to personalised recall intervals. Now, basically what they're doing is they're saying there is that they don't believe that having gone to all the trouble of having a nice meet and, rec you know, and recommend that everybody isn't recalled every six months. Because remember the background to this was that everybody sort of, it got ingrained into the collective consciousness that you needed to have a checkup every six months. And it was the Department of Health assertion that this was just, just playing into the hands of the dental surgery because everybody trooped, trooped up to the dentist every six months and ended up with a load of treatment that they didn't need. Um, you know, then the patients were being served up to dentists on a conveyor belt. So what they did um, was they said, you know, this is not necessary. Um, you know, if your teeth are fairly healthy, then you may well be better off staying away from the dentist, implying that the dentist was a you know an adverse life event <laughs> you're gonna in the same way you should stay away from uh whores and uh, street magicians and stuff like that you know so dentists dentists were bad for uh, your dental health and of course the bd sort of just swallowed this as, as usual and and uh you know and there is some argument to be made for stretching out recall intervals although you know, I haven't been in the business for 40 years. I'm honestly uh, getting back to the opinion now that a six monthly recall is necessary. Because we have stretched an awful lot of people's recall intervals out. We have, um, we have stretched people out to a year, you know, typically if they, they appear to be okay. And then, um, and, and then we found out that they've come back after six months because something's gone wrong or something's fallen off or they've got a toothache and then we find that, you know, their, their, their annual recalls are not all they're cracked up to be. They are a good idea in principle, but in practice, um, you know, I think obviously it depends very much on whether you're an ethical dentist. If you're an unethical dentist and you want to see people every six months for the purpose of finding work that probably doesn't need doing, then, you know, the patients are walking into that trap. But um, if you're an ethical dentist, then I would certainly say, I would see all my patients, possibly with the exception of full, full denture cases who just need a cancer inspection once in a while. But even then, you know, modern dentures are not all they're cracked up to be. They've all got this very, very soft acrylic teeth and they wear out very quickly and 
patients are wearing them all the time, they're getting mouth infections and stuff like that. So um, what they've done is they've decided, now, and this is a key, right? You have to understand that this is the sort of overriding, overarching theme to these recommendations is that they are, have decided what they've already done that uh, they isn't being uh, followed up by the profession that they need to just push, make another big push on. Stuff that they've already done to fix the system, but the system isn't fixed because the fix is not being applied. So producing supportive material for patients, the public, and dental teams around nice recall intervals just means saying to the patients, like, you know, you don't have to go every six months if you don't think you need to. Don't let your dentist tell you that you need to come in every six months. Don't let your dentist send you a recall every six months. If you don't think you need to go in every six months, then we agree with you. You, you Perhaps you don't. And um, what they're going to do is they're going to uh, remind, as I say, dental teams again, which is another sort of a push to try and say to dentists, don't just recall everybody every six months. Make sure you've got some people on nine months, 10 months, 12 months, whatever. And the flip side of that, of course, is that um, <coughs> you can have people on less than six months if they're high risk. And um, we certainly have a large number of our patients on four monthly, which is three checkups a year if they're on the preventive plan, because it's our job to spot anything before it happens. And so I figure, and also to um, bash home some uh, oral hygiene instruction, which I find they retain much better if it's not six months since they last came. If it's six months, they tend to have forgotten what you told them. If it's four months, they will actually still remember what you told them. And so you can build on your previous um, advice. If it's six months or longer, you can't build on your previous advice. You have to start all over again because they've forgotten what you told them. So they're, in, they're going to introduce an extra field on the FP17, which is the reporting uh, form. Um, and that's because, again, this is this, uh, fetish for micromanagement. They're going to uh, now, you know, uh, I mean, it's quite true that whatever is measured improves. And so by measuring it, I suppose they are going to get to see some evidence that uh, dentists are doing this, whether or not that evidence will be actual evidence or, or just, you know, uh, borrow type reporting uh, is anybody's guess. But, um, but anyway, so let's move on. So that's that. That's just like nothing. That's nothing new. That's just an old thing that they're going to say, like, you know, you're not doing it properly. Um, you, you have to laugh because um, anybody whose model of the world is incorrect, anybody who's like, if you take a politician who's stood for uh, election on a, on a certain platform and, and failed to get elected, <coughs> you'll... Um, you do get this denial where they are, there's this sort of a tension between their model of the world and the real world. And uh, they try and reconcile it by saying that people don't understand or that people weren't properly informed or uh, people have uh, not, the head's not right, you know, they're not thinking straight, they haven't got their head on right and they don't, um, therefore they've done the wrong thing. Whereas what they was quite clear that what they were recommending was the right thing and everybody else did something else, and so therefore everybody else, they're right and everybody else is wrong. Um, establishing a new minimum indicative UDA value. Well, um, and this is the whole question of suicide tendering. Um, first of all, why, you know, why would you want to introduce a minimum UDA value? Surely if you're uh, a commissioning authority, um, and someone says, oh, I'll, I'll work for you for five pounds a unit. Why would you want to say no? I'm, I'm, so that's no good. I'm going to insist on paying you 10 pound a unit or 20 pound a unit. Why? It just doesn't make any sense. And the answer is that um, if you put a NHS contract out to tender, let's say that the, you know, let's just pick a figure out of thin air and say that 25 pounds a unit is is, is generally what's required to carry out the amount of work that's required in the average tender. And then you'll get uh, some people, let's say you get two people tender at 30, two people tender at 25, and one tenders at 15. Well, the thing is that the, um, 
the tendency is to award the contract to the one the person who's tendered at 15 by turning a blind eye to the fact that it's obviously not economically viable for them to do the work that they're required to do and so what you do is you sort of convince yourself that um, they've invented some new uh, way of doing dentistry which is ultra cheap and that you want to reward innovation uh, by giving them contracts for this new cheap NHS work and um, and then what happens is uh, obviously there's a you know something goes wrong there's supervised neglect the chain goes bust uh, and you get a thing uh, called uh, suicide tendering which is basically a situation where uh, a group or a surgery puts in a bid which is way below the market rate for the contract and as a result nobody else gets the contract <coughs> so, <coughs> all these people that tended at 25 and 30 and put all the money into creating a tender and that they don't get the tender they see it go to someone who they know is is bidding unrealistically low and who then goes bust so that's a problem for the four people who put in realistic tenders the commissioning authority and all the employees of the people of the group that got got the tender awarded so um it does say it's indicative so i don't i know it's not proscriptive they're not going to say you know thou shalt not tender at less than 25 pound a unit or whatever but they're just going to say look any tenders that come in at eight pound a unit or something just don't you know unless they've literally developed a robot that drills and, and puts chewing gum in people's teeth don't bother you know but that's um you know the, the reason why i'm not happy with that is because it's it's an abuse it's a corruption of the market-based mechanisms that should be setting the price for these things um and uh, it's again it's another type of micromanagement isn't it trying to say oh well the system's broken and it's not broken because we're running it, it's broken because we're not running it enough. Um, they're going to address misunderstandings around the use of skill mix in, in NHS dental care while um, removing some of the administrative barriers preventing dental care professionals from operating within their full scope of practice. So, so dental care professionals, they're talking about nurses and hygienists and therapists, not really dentists there. Although technically, dentists are included in that the DCP is just shorthand for non-dentists so so again they've they did they've had a big push on uh, trying to get <clears throat> the dentistry the, the job of dentistry done by non-dentists the idea being obviously to expand the size of the workforce that can do any particular work and uh, depress wages by um, increasing competition in supply of the workforce and um, so uh, addressing misunderstandings around the use of skill mix seems to me to imply that they've decided that the solution is there but most people don't understand how to use it you know you've got you've got the mechanism to solve the problem but you just don't know how to make it work and the way that they wanted it to work and want it to work is uh, to give you a couple of examples is hygiene hygienists they didn't want uh, patients to have to come to see hygienists through a dentist and the reason for that was that hygiene is in big demand a lot of people like to have their teeth descaled and polished by hygienists even though you know hygienists isn't a dentist but the public hold hygienists in high regard and a lot of them would rather be seen by hygienists than a dentist because it's a cosmetic procedure thereafter it's not a clinical there's no clinical need it's cosmetic they don't want to brush their teeth. They'd rather the hygienist brush their teeth. So what they do is they want to come and see the hygienist a lot. But by, by having the dentist as the gatekeeper, they run into their old problem of dentists are bad for dentistry because they're going to recommend that you have a ton of stuff done and like, you know, perhaps get the odd filling done or whatever. So they said, no, <clears throat> the hygienist should be free to accept patients without uh, them having been through a dentist. Now, the hygienists were very reluctant to do this. I mean, there was a few militant ones who obviously loved the idea, mainly, um, I think, corporate bodies who got the you know, like to set up a, a limited company just doing dental hygiene um, and employ a few hygienists um, and, and skim the money off the top. But 
the hygienists don't like it for two reasons. One is that they'd have to run their own surgeries. Either that or they have to rent a surgery or work within a surgery for a dentist and, and, and sort of try and work through the dentist receptionist to get patients to come in uh, without seeing the dentist and advertise direct access. They'd have to do probably their own advertising because why would the dentist advertise it? You know, there's nothing in it for the dentist. So, um, and the other thing is that for the most part, the patients who come and see the hygienists are, um, do need to see a dentist. <laughs> hygienists are very reluctant to have a bunch of patients come in and saying, oh, by the way, uh, what do you think about this tooth? It's been giving me toothache lately, or, um, you know, uh, I've got this black dot on my tooth. Do you think it's decayed? Um, they're not really, uh, they don't want that. You know, they want the, de the patients to have been triaged by a dentist. And the other thing was the dental therapists. They um, decided that they were going to undermine the profession by inventing a tier of clinicians that could do fillings. The easy stuff, you know, just the stuff that uh, th th they were hoping was, would be the bulk of the work. And, um, <clears throat> and, and they started off by saying, yeah, well, they can perhaps do children's dentistry because, let's face it, most dentists, not, you know, it's not their favourite work, children's dentistry. And so to have someone like a dental therapist who said, yeah, no, I can do all the kids' fillings in the practice, is fine. But then they never really got adopted. I don't think they were allowed to use them in general practice because they didn't trust the dentist not to ask them to do adult fillings and all sorts of other stuff as well. So I think they were only ever used in hospitals in the community. And so uh, what they're going to do is they're going to sort of try and make a big push to try and uh, dilute the workforce again with a load of ancillary workers. Um, and that <clears throat> includes probably writing to every uh, nurse and reminding them that they can take impressions and that they can um, give injections and things like that, providing they're properly trained, take x-rays and stuff like that, providing they're properly trained. <clears throat> the dentist as the team leader, I think, has, <clears throat> has, all, has probably already got his team pretty well optimised, you know. I mean, I think that uh, things are probably working pretty well with that Department of Health. Uh, telling him what to do. And then um, lastly, um, uh, improving information for patients by up updating this directory of services, which is the online website where you go, where, where you know, who's my local NHS dentist. And <clears throat> what happens is you've got all these, uh, you've got this big long list of dentists because every dentist is listed. And then um, they all say, uh, no, not accepting NHS patients, not accepting NHS patients, not accepting NHS patients. And then underneath that, it says last updated February 2018, last updated January 2016, last updated December 2019, you know. And so what they really want is they want like a, re a real time directory of where you can get an NHS dentist. Uh, they don't want patients ringing them up and saying, you know, they say, oh, you go to this website, and they say, well, I've been to the website, and, uh, you know, the nearest dentist is um, 35 miles away, which might be all right, except it's directly across the Thames estuary, and so it's a four-hour trip. So, that's not going to, that's not going to happen, because they just, they're not fast enough to do that, do you know what I mean? They'd have to ring up every dentist every day. And the other thing is that uh, most dentists don't really want public to know if they're taking on NHS. Believe me, they've got enough people on their waiting list with the friends of the existing patients and relatives of existing patients um, and, and locals without it going on a website that they're taking on NHS patients. But once again, but also it sort of, it just shows you how out of touch the Department of Health is because they think that there are plenty of NHS dentists out there and they can't understand why they're, the, 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 the website doesn't reflect that. You know, they're they're like, you know, well, if only the people that are taking NHS patients would, would take five minutes just to update their entry on the NHS, who's accepting NHS patients website, then, um, then you know, we wouldn't have to spend all our time on the phone all day answering queries from patients and local radio about why there's no NHS dentists. So, um, so in conclusion, I think they're still, they're still in this bubble, you know, they're still living in this world where everything's fine if only people would just uh, get their heads straight and uh, just follow the rules a bit better and, <laughs> and, uh, and admit that uh, there's NHS dentistry every, going on everywhere. Uh, but just, um, but just uh, 
it's not, you know, but it's been done behind closed doors, so no one knows about it. Anyway, um, so obviously nobody's really worried about any of that. So, um, but if there, if there are some real substantive changes to anything, I'll let you know. Okay. All right. Nice to talk to you. Bye.